I lived in the United States for many years, and I was shocked at how much green there is here. And so I must say, you live in an amazing place. Um, do not take it for granted. Um, it is an absolute delight and pleasure for me to be here this evening. Um, I have to tell you, I'm not sure I would have shown up with the amount of rain that's outside. Um, so I'm really grateful that you've made it. And to me, it really is a, uh, a signal that uh, you, like me, are incredibly concerned about um, the state of affairs, not just in Africa, but across the developing world um, in places where countries continue to rely very heavily on the largesse from outside. Um, what I thought I'd do this evening is really spend some time um, talking a little bit about some of the arguments that I make in the book. I don't want to give you everything so that you can go out and buy it, um, but also talk a little bit about solutions. And my, my intention in this book was not to be um, a naysayer. Um, a friend of mine once said there are two types of people. There are yes people and there are no people. And uh, I happen to come from a home of um, yes people because my parents um, somehow were so deluded that they didn't tell me that uh, actually there were certain things I was not supposed to be able to do. So um, being raised in the Moyo household basically meant that when I said I want to go and study in the United States, I said, absolutely, go ahead, you can do it. And I only found out later that uh, people would say, well, actually, you know, you're an African woman from Zambia, so maybe you won't be able to make it there. Um, so I, I'm a yes person. My book is about um, things that we as a global society can and should be doing to actually transform um, the African uh, uh, condition. Um, my main thesis is very simple. The current aid system um, that pervades the African continent is, I believe, couched in what um, George Bush, and I have to say, I'm very surprised I'm quoting him, um, <laughs> but what I believe George Bush uh, said was um, this, the soft bigotry of low expectations. Um, I strongly believe that there is one method and uh, policy of economic development when it comes to countries like China, Russia, India, Brazil, and a completely different approach to economic development when it comes to countries across the African continent. I'm here to tell you today that for the past 60 years, over $1 trillion of aid has gone to Africa. That's about $100 for every man, woman, and child on Earth today. And yet, growth, is less today than it was um, in, in the 1970s. And in the 1970s, 10% um, of the African population lived on less than a dollar a day. Um, today, over 70% of Africans live on less than a dollar a day. Clearly, something is wrong. And uh, I'm here to explain to you what I think is going on. Uh, in fact, what I know is going on. I was raised in Zambia, Southern Africa. I went to primary school secondary school and university until we had a uh, coup, coup d'etat in 1991. Um, any good African country has to have an attempt to throw, overthrow of government. So we had ours in 1991. Um, and so anyone who says that I am not African or somehow, um, as uh, Jeffrey Sachs has said, uh, I don't have a child in rural Africa, therefore I have no right to say anything about what's going on in the continent is completely absurd. Uh, my family lives in Africa. I'm in Africa about once every five weeks, somewhere, somewhere across the continent. Um, and I think it's uh, really important for us as a global society to take a good hard look at what's going on across this continent. I want to start off by saying that there are at least three things that I believe we agree on. And by we, I mean the world in general. I think um, it's very easy for people to say, well, she's against aid and he's pro-aid and they're fighting against each other. And um, having spent uh, many years living in the United States and also in Europe, I know there's a, a lovely tendency um, for people to want to pigeonhole people. She's Republican, he's Democrat, she's black, he's white, uh, she's uh, 40, between 40 and 45 and so on. So we're always categorizing. And so immediately my book came out, they, they, I got labeled as a, a right-wing, um, anti-aid uh, um, person. And I'm here to say, that we should not, as a society, get caught up in these titles. Um, I think it's critically important that we look at the issues based on logic and evidence, which is why I love coming to academic institutions, and not on emotion, because the emotion has not helped. There are specifically three things that I believe we all agree on. The first thing I believe we all agree on is that nobody wants Africa to be dependent on aid forever. And by the way, I, I always offer the opportunity to the audience, if anybody thinks that we do want to see Africa on aid forever, you're welcome to put your hand up and we can have that debate. But I think the goal, which tends to be lost, is 
we would love to see Africa and African countries and Africans as equal partners on the global stage. We don't want to live in a society where it's us and them, donor and recipient, and uh, Africa continues to be viewed very much as a drag on the global economy. The second thing I think is critically important that we need to understand is that we need African governments to be involved front and center at the de development agenda. It is not good enough for Westerners as individuals to care about Africa. And it's not good enough for African individuals like myself to care about Africa. And nor does it matter if America or Western governments care about Africa if the African governments themselves are not leading the charge of economic development. This is really, really important. And uh, there was a wonderful article that was written by um, President Kagame of Rwanda back in February um, this year uh, in the Financial Times, where he said people need to remember they should not pretend to themselves that they care about our continent more than we do. And I think that was a very, very powerful statement. Um, certainly as an African, it was really quite moving. And I have noticed, having spent a lot of time on the road this year, that people do have that sense that somehow they care more about Africa than we as Africans do. Um, and yet our families live there, we are from there, and hopefully um, generations to come of Africans will be able to live there in, uh, in, in decent living conditions. So we need African governments involved. The third point, I have to say, I've completely stolen. It's an, a point that was made by um, the, the um, Minister of Development in Norway. Some people in here might be aware that Norway gives 1% of its income, the country's income, to aid. So um, when my book first came out, I got an invitation to go to Norway. I was pretty surprised. I was like, this is weird. Um, a country that gives them um, so much aid um, has asked me to go and visit with them. Um, I don't know if there are any people from Scandinavia, Norway in here, anyone? No? Nobody? Oh, oh, somebody there in the back. Anyway, they're very open people. Um, and, you know, they love a debate. They love a good, a good, uh, a good argument. And so um, I had never been to Oslo. And so I immediately said yes, and I, I went on my way. And um, I was in a debate, public forum, with the minister. And um, surprisingly, Minister Sondheim, uh, Minister of, of Development, said, we all have to accept that aid has contributed to the dysfunctionality of African governments. And I looked at him stunned, because I was like, hang on, he's making my points for me. Um, but I was very happy to hear that. Um, and I think that is really, really important. I mean, here is a government minister who supports the aid regime, but he at the same time is critical enough to say, let's accept where it is lacking. Um, I will come back to this point a little bit later, but suffice it to say, the manner in which aid is causing a dysfunctionality of African governments does vary. On the one hand, we know, you know, if you, if you went outside now and polled 100 people um, and asked them what they think the problem with aid is to Africa, most people would say corruption. So that's a big story. It's always in the news. Um, but even in the best case scenarios, one of the problems with the aid system is that it allows African governments to abdicate their responsibilities of providing public goods to people like me. So I will come back to this point because I, it's very, very important. It's actually at the crux of the problem um, that we're facing in Africa today. So those are the three points, and I, I hope that uh, you bear them in mind. As I said, uh, number one, we, do, we want to see Africa develop. Number two, we want to get African governments uh, engaged. And number three, we have to accept that aid has certainly contributed um, to the uh, dysfunctionality of African governments. Um, I did jump ahead a little bit because I haven't really explained what I mean by aid. Um, on page seven of my book, I believe, I do explain that there are different types of aid, and very quickly, uh, I delineate them into three categories. The first type of aid is what we would call humanitarian or emergency aid. So think about Katrina or an earthquake in Iran or the tsunami um, or floods in Mozambique. And I think we, as a global society, have a moral imperative to act when that kind of thing happens. Um, and so I am not criticizing emergency aid. The second type of aid is what I call NGO and charitable aid. Um, so this is sort of send $3 a month to build a well in Zambia, which is where I'm from, or um, send $10 a month to help a girl go to school. Um, I myself am involved in charities, um, quite a number of, of fantastic charities. One of them uh, had a gala, that, which is why I was a bit late coming um, to North Carolina. 
um, called Room to Read, which is an education charity. And I think it's very important that we understand the limitations of that type of aid. Yes, a girl can go to school, but we should not delude ourselves into thinking that somehow the African continent is going to grow at 10% a year simply because we're sending $10 towards a charitable uh, initiative. Um, and I stress this because I'm not saying don't send money um, towards building a well, but understand that it's not fundamentally going to overhaul the African condition um, so that Africa can be an equal partner on the global stage. Um, just as a, a metric worth watching, the UN um, believes or argues that African countries need to grow at around 7% a year in order to meaningfully put a dent in poverty. Does anybody know what the uh, average rate of growth in Africa is for this year for forecasted? Any guesses? Say again? Yeah, that's right. It's about 2%. Um, in fact, the IMF until April was forecasting it to be around 3%. And uh, I, I went to see the head of the IMF. Um, he'd asked me to, to visit with him about the book. And uh, that was a pretty good growth rate. I mean, it was, given what's happened in the past 18 months, um, it's quite a good growth, growth rate. Um, compared to where the, the global growth was projected at 0.5 and a number of regions growing negatively. Um, but the point there is that 3% growth is nowhere near the 7% um, that we need, uh, minimum that we need to actually meaningfully put a dent in poverty. So anyway, um, I, I digress. The point is that that's a second type of aid, it's NGO charitable aid. Go ahead and do it, but understand it's not going to transform the continent. The third type of aid is the aid that I'm criticizing, which is the billion dollars, um, just so you know, it's $100 billion a year, uh, over $100 billion a year that's going to Africa now. $100 billion a year of aid that goes from government to government every year. And as I said earlier in my opening remarks, um, this system has been in existence in some form or another um, since the 1950s. I want to just stop for a minute and take you back to the 1950s. Um, this was a time we post-World War II, and it was the time of the Marshall Plan. And I have to say that had I been a policymaker at that time, I probably would have been a big supporter of aid. It made sense. And the link was very simple, and I'm sure the economists in the room, the idea was that savings leads to investment, and investment leads to growth. And from growth, you could get a reduction in poverty. And remember, this was coming out of the Marshall Plan, which had been incredibly successful, which is about $100 billion in today's terms that was sent from the United States to Europe. And I'll come back to this point because there have been some successful stories of aid, but the difference between those type of interventions and the type of intervention of aid that we have in Africa today is that programs like the Marshall Plan were short, sharp, and finite. So the Marshall Plan, $100 billion over five years, they went in and they left. That is not the system that we're grappling with today in Africa. And I'll come back to this point um, as well because basically it's again at the core of the issue. Many African governments view aid money as permanent income. They do not see a time when aid is ever going to end. And that is a big problem. But suffice it to say that at that time it would have made sense to make the case for, uh, for aid replacing savings because many African countries were coming out of colonial, uh, colonialism and didn't have the domestic savings that would lead to investment, that would lead to growth and reduce poverty. So we put in the aid money, and the aid was supposed to lead to investment, and that investment was supposed to lead to growth and reduce poverty. It made sense. But here we are now, 50, 60 years later, on those two metrics, increase in growth and reduction of poverty, aid has absolutely failed. Paul Collier, who many of you may be familiar with, his work, he's um, written a book called The Bottom Billion, was my, actually my PhD supervisor. And he has a fantastic phrase where he talks about Africa shearing off from the rest of the world. So the world is going in one direction and Africa is going in a completely different direction. Um, per capita income, so the amount of income that Africans earn today is lower than it was 40 years ago. I've already told you the poverty statistics. Um, and this is layered on with the fact that over 60% of Africans are under the age of 24. So we've got a very, very young population, um, and this is basically a time bomb. We do not, we're not creating jobs fast enough. We've created a Band-Aid solution, and ultimately we have a situation where over the long term, those young people will not have opportunities, they will not have jobs, 
and we've created a system where we as Africans are addicted to donor money when the donor countries themselves have a financial crisis. Again, something I'll come back to. In any case, the fact of the matter is we have not had the growth that we need and the poverty levels are rising and they continue to rise today in Africa. The question is why? Why is it something that seems like such a good idea, um, uh, at least on paper, is not working in practice? And I have here my uh, top 10 reasons why aid does not work. Um, but rather, as I said to you earlier, if I tell you all of them, uh, I don't think you'll rush out to buy the book. So I'll give you a bit of a teaser. Um, some of the things I've already start, I talked about already. Um, the most obvious one, I'm not gonna spend time on it because I think everybody knows about this, um, is corruption. Um, some of the people who don't like my book have said, oh, you know, Dambisa, corruption is an old story. It doesn't happen anymore. Boy, are they wrong. Um, I was just in my home country in Zambia in, uh, in May, and there was a massive scandal um, because the Zambian president, who, by the way, Zambia was considered a development darling um, throughout the 1990s, um, our former president is embroiled in a corruption scandal, having stolen money and paid um, to have designer clothes made by some Belgian tailor. Um, and people know, but they turn a blind eye. Um, next door in Malawi, the former president there is also embroiled in scandal, stealing $12 million that was earmarked for HIV AIDS drugs. Um, this is not from the 1970s. This is going on this year. So um, the people who think that uh, giving aid money with basically no conditions attached, uh, if they think that corruption has come to an end, um, they're wrong. Transparency International, which is a, uh, a not-for-profit organization, uh, every year has something called the CPI, the Corruption Perceptions uh, Index, and consistently African countries are at the bottom. And I, I strongly believe, and I argue in the book, that there's a direct, direct link there. Um, you cannot have rent-seeking, which is the economics term for corruption and bribery, um, when you don't have a rent to steal. And the problem is that aid is a fantastic rent to steal. Um, and we know it's being stolen. And we know that aid is not reaching the right people, um, but nobody seems to care. Um, inflation, the debt burden, uh, Dutch disease. So do people know what Dutch disease is? Dutch disease, um, it's called Dutch disease because it was first identified in the Netherlands. It's very simply the idea that you get a flood of money coming into your economy. So in Zambia, for example, our currency is the kwacha. But if you dump in a lot of US dollars, then you have more dollars in the economy than you do kwacha. So the kwacha becomes very strong. It appreciates. And then nobody wants to buy Zambian products because your currency is too strong. So Dutch disease, and by the way, I should have pointed out that the, what I'm talking about here is not Dambisa Moyo cooked this up in the kitchen. These, are, these um, problems with aid are very well researched and uh, have been studied by the donors themselves, the IMF, the World Bank, and in, in the back of the book, I, I cite a number of, uh, of articles. But the point being that things like Dutch disease, like the debt burden, inflation, are directly linked to the amount of aid money that's going into these small economies. It's causing distortions and it's undermining long-term economic growth. Um, I mentioned earlier that one of the fundamental problems with the aid system is that African governments are allowed to abdicate their responsibilities. And I want to just take a moment here for you to think about the society in which you live, the United States. Remember here that things like public goods, so public goods are things like a lamppost that everybody benefits from, but no single person is paying for it. And those type of things, the government steps in. And there are plenty of other examples. Education, healthcare, or maybe healthcare is a bit of a hot potato now here, but uh, healthcare, infrastructure, security, these are things that everybody benefits from, but the, nobody, no one person is paying for them. Public goods across the African continent, I repeat, education, healthcare, infrastructure, and security are being provided by the international community. They are not being provided by African governments. Now you might sit back and say, well, so what? what is that? What's the big deal with that? I'll tell you two problems with that. The first one is a problem that was raised to me by a friend of mine, an economist who is um, Peruvian, lives in Peru. And he said the fundamental problem with that type of system is that it clearly highlights the difference between independence and decolonization. And although many Africans like myself on October 24th 
have a big party because our country became independent. We're actually not independent. We are decolonized. We are still an appendage of the financial system that is outside. We are still part of the American or the British tax system. And that's a problem. Because when it comes time for me holding my government accountable, it actually doesn't matter, which is actually relates to the second point. The second point being, you are asking us as Africans to sit back and rely on your resources to finance our education, our health care, our infrastructure, and our security. I'm going to give you a specific example here. Zambia, which is my home country, um, has, is one of the worst HIV AIDS countries on earth. About one in three Zambians is HIV positive. Now, to most people, and by the way, it's about 10 million people population. To most people, that is an epidemic and we should be seriously concerned. Our government should be absolutely concerned. In fact, our president should not be sleeping. He should be up 24 hours, focused only on the fact that this is such an epidemic of HIV across the country. Many of you probably don't know that about 95% of the infrastructure, so software and hardware, the drugs, the doctors, the nurses, the, the buildings, is provided by USAID. That's the American Agency for uh, International Development. Again, you might say, well, so what? That's a good thing. We're proud as Americans to be able to help you in Zambia who can't provide drugs to your people. But let me ask you this. The American economy has got problems right now. 10%, one, one in every 10 Americans is out of a job. We've got a massive budget deficit, huge amount of debt, and you're borrowing from China. Does it make sense for me as a Zambian to sit back and relax and rely on you to provide and underwrite the cost of health care in my country? It seems to me not, which is why it's important for African governments to start thinking about other ways of financing economic development. The example I've just given to you about health care is not the only example. The whole continent, you've got places like um, the largest population of um, UN security forces is in DRC Congo. Education is being underwritten by British government and other donors. Britain, another casualty of the financial crisis, 13% budget deficit, massive amount of debt to GDP, a lot of people out of work. Should I in Zambia rely on the British government to finance my children's education? It seems to me to be very silly. However, that is the system that we're operating in right now. And the problem is, anytime anybody even opens their mouth to say maybe African government should think about alternative ways of financing development, we get pilloried. People do not want to have the discussion about exits, and yet it is absolutely critical for us, given our population dynamics. Remember, 60% of the population under the age of 24. In countries like Uganda, 50% of the population is under the age of 15. And you want us to sit back and wait for somebody to hand us out money. I don't know how many people have actually been into African countries recently. Anybody? Yeah? Then you will know what I'm talking about when I say if you go to most metropoles, whether it's Lagos or Lusaka or Nairobi, there are lots of young people on the streets selling trinkets. Am I right? Yes? I see nods. Selling T-shirts and chickens and mirrors and DVDs. In 10 years' time, those guys will still be on the streets, and so will their children. What is going to happen then? Why are we not asking the question, what is going to happen then? Very quickly here, um, a friend of mine uh, is a Somalian-born uh, author. Probably some of you might know Ayan Hirsi Ali. In fact, I have to be careful about claiming she's a friend because she's got a fatwa on her. Um, <laughs> somebody I know. <laughs> No, she's actually fabulous, um, and if you haven't had her here, you should have her here. Um, uh, very interesting, um, and they, they claim I'm controversial. I'm nothing compared to her. Um, but uh, she and I had dinner, uh, as it turns out, the night that the pirates, do you remember the pirate being arrested in Somalia and brought to the United States? Yes, it was not too long ago. I think it must have been May or something. Anyway, she and I were having dinner that night. It was the first time I had met her, and she said to me, um, and she's, she's lived in exile um, since 1992 when Somalia had uh, um, its uh, civil war began. 
and she's, it's, which is 17 years ago, and she said, do you realize that any child born in 1992 or later, so 17 year old, has not spent a single day in school? And I hadn't, I hadn't realized that. Actually, it's very funny. People always say, oh, do you know, do you know I and Hersey? They're only a billion Africans on the continent, but I suppose they assume that we know each other. But in any case, <laughs> in this case, they're right, actually, because we do know each other. But the point being, that's a generation lost. No opportunities, no jobs, nothing going on. And across the metropoles in Africa, that number is increasing rapidly. I worry when I go home. I, step, I stop at the traffic lights in my car and there are tons of young people. Smart, they've gone through high school, got you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, no job. We should be worried, we're not creating jobs. Let me go back into the, into the main body. I've talked about uh, some of the big problems with aid. I told you already that one of the fundamental problems is that African governments are viewing aid money as permanent. And when you hear all these campaigners, let's give more money to Africa, they're not even nuanced in their approach and thinking to say, where's the money coming from? You know, the Western societies, particularly in Europe, are facing demographic shifts, which are very well known. People know that the populations are aging. Very likely GDP will shrink. Where is the money going to come from? Even in the best case scenario, there is a crisis at the source of funding, and people do not want to accept that. Another problem with aid is that it kills off entrepreneurship. Um, you might not be surprised, and I don't know if people are familiar, but the World Bank every year puts out a ranking called um, Doing Business Around the World. It ranks countries from the best country, the easiest place to do business, to the worst country. Again, no surprises, African countries are at the bottom. And I can tell you right now, it's an absolute nightmare. Even for somebody like me who's a shrinking violet, um, to go into Zambia and try and open a business is an absolute nightmare. Now, we should ask ourselves, if governments are interested in creating jobs, creating opportunities, building an entrepreneurial culture, why should it be so difficult to get a business license? In some countries in Africa, it can take two years to get a business license. Two years to get a business license. By comparison, places like Australia is a day. Two years. Does that sound to you like a government that's actually interested in creating jobs, creating opportunities? It doesn't to me. In February, I went to Kenya, Tanzania, and Rwanda, three countries that are right near each other. I needed to get three different visas and change my currency three times. Again, does that sound to you like these are governments who are serious about creating jobs and opportunities and building trade and networks across the continent? It doesn't to me. Again, why is it that these governments would have that attitude? And I would argue that it's precisely because they know that they live or die in office because of aid, and they spend much more time courting and catering to the donors and spend almost zero, in fact, probably zero, listening to their constituents, which is ostensibly people like me. There's a lot of evidence that aid is correlated to civil wars, civil unrest. Again, no surprise that this year, Africa has had four coups. We haven't even got to December yet, so you know, hold your breath. Four coups. That's the overthrow of governments, four this year. Um, there was more civil unrest, war, and conflicts in Africa than there was in the rest of the world put together in the 1990s. I mean, this is not a haven of, of jolliness. Why am I linking that to aid? Um, Professor Grossman, I guess in the back of my book, I, I give some citations, has done a lot of research. Paul Collier has done a lot of research about the fact that, that in a society where you're not building up the private sector, you're not giving people opportunities to build their own businesses, the only source of cash for survival pools at the state level, and that's aid money. So constantly you have governments um, being overthrown, people trying to, factions trying to overthrow governments precisely because they're trying to get their hands on the aid money. It's, it, it's not a far reach. Um, that is the way many people in Africa live today. If there's one thing I want you to remember, and you can ignore everything else I've said thus far, but the key problem with the aid system is that it disenfranchises Africans. It is a great tragedy, and it breaks my heart that in 2009, people like celebrities are much more loved and adored 
um, at the G8 and the World Bank meetings and so on than African presidents. I'm sure if I asked you to name five African presidents, many of you would struggle. And if I asked you to even articulate for me what the vision for one African president is, you'd struggle even more. And that's because, frankly, nobody listens to what African presidents have to say. And uh, yes, some of them are bad, but there are a handful of them that are really trying to make a difference. Nobody listens to them. You have to be able to strum a guitar in order to be heard. And trust me, I love good music, but I'm just saying I don't want them to design economic policy for my continent. <laughs> now, why are they, how is it that aid is disenfranchising Africans? The Boston Tea Party, which is here in the United States, there's a fantastic saying around that, which is no taxation without representation. The problem in Africa is the reverse Boston Tea Party. We get no representation because there's no taxation. Our governments, as I said earlier, live or die in office because of the donations that they get in the form of aid. If the aid were cut off and they had to stay in office based on the tax receipts, which is basically, by the way, the system that you live under, President Obama knows that if Americans get pretty damn irritated, he's going to be out of a job. But you know, that's not the case in most of Africa. We have presidents, even today, who've been in power for 40 years, 30 years, 20 years. Even Mugabe, people you know, throw these tantrums about Mugabe. The American government has had an ambassador there since this, this problem started. What have you done about it? The British government has had diplomatic ties with Zimbabwe throughout all this problem. The greatest um, slap on the wrist that they gave him was that they took away his knighthood last year. <laughs> all of this is to say, we have to ask ourselves, what type of society are we trying to build? You have to ask that question. I very much view myself as part of the lost generation of Africans. This is not a battle for me. Um, the life expectancy in my country is 37. I'm happy to say I passed uh, my 40th birthday in February, so I'm over the hill. <laughs> passed my sell by date according to uh, Zambian standards. But this is not about me anymore. This is about the next generation of Africans, the young Africans who want to be part of the Twitter generation, want to be able to be on Facebook, but things are not getting better for them. And all I'm asking you is to apply the same standards that you apply to yourselves to apply to them and to our continent. You cannot have double standards and expect a different result. The aid system has failed and have tried many different interventions. In the 1960s, they focused on aid for infrastructure. 1970s, aid was targeted towards poverty reduction. The 1980s, they said, no, 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 we got it wrong, focused on structural adjustment and stabilization. 1990s, oh, sorry, got it wrong again, let's focus on democracy and governance. Somehow delusioned into the fact that we can shoehorn in democracy instead of it coming up uh, organically. And now, after 1990s, we're in this absurd situation where the, country, the continent is completely overrun with charitable organizations, all with good intentions, but the fact of the matter, allowing the governments to sit back and relax and take a holiday instead of taking their responsibility. Look at the scorecard. African governments have not performed. They have got to accept that. The world has to accept that. And instead of creating the infrastructure for us to do better as Africans, you're making it easier for us to do worse. Now, I did say to you early on that the book is supposed to be positive. And the good news, which there is, is that we know how to create growth and we know how to create development. In the past 30 years, we have seen China move 300 million people out of poverty. By the way, there are more poor Chinese than there are poor Africans. There are more poor Indians than there are Africans. But you know what? We don't feel sorry for the Chinese, and we don't feel sorry for the, the, the Indians. But somehow, we've convinced ourselves that we should feel sorry for Africans and give them more handouts. That is a double standard right there. The system of economic development that has been applied in China, as I said, in, in Russia, in Brazil, in India, and even closer to home in South Africa and Botswana, is not one where they sat back and took aid money ad infinitum. Yes, 
there are countries like the aid graduates, places like South Korea and Botswana that did receive aid, but again, like the Marshall Plan, short, sharp interventions. They were not open-ended commitments that you see across the African continent. As I said, the good news is that we know what creates development. Um, I strongly believe that it's low-hanging fruit in Africa. I mean, some of the things that are going on in this continent are an absolute joke. Um, and it would not take much to actually make a big difference. I'll give you an example. Trade. Um, forget about us trying to sell our goods in the United States or Europe. I think that's not going to happen. Politically, it doesn't make sense. I would love there to be free markets, but they don't exist. Um, but the fact of the matter is, even within the African continent, between African countries, tariff rates are, are double digit, sometimes as much as 30% between two African countries. So charity starts at home. Um, and I think we've got a lot of work to be done there. Things like foreign direct investment, the capital markets, which have been pilloried for, but I'll come back to that in a second, microfinance, remittances, savings, taxes. This is how other countries, the United States, uh, Britain, this is how other countries raise their money. They don't rely on aid, nor have they. And so all I'm saying is apply the same standard. My policy recommendations are very simple. Um, I think what would actually transform the system is if we had a form of aid which, uh, where we knew explicitly and transparently that it would phase out over time. Now, in the book I give an example. I tell you, the whole notion of giving an example, it's amazing how English gets all messed up and people don't understand what an example is. But I gave an example and I said, what if we had a five-year policy? Now, in practice, let's get serious, people. There's no way we can have a blanket five-year policy for every country. I've just explained to you a place like Somalia is obviously very different from a country like Zambia or Ghana. So we cannot have one blanket policy. And people, instead of uh, seeing through and really focusing on the main issue, which is we should have exit strategies, want to get all excited, oh, it's a five years. I didn't say five years. That would be completely ridiculous. However, I am saying, let's take a good, hard look and say, is there a way for countries to systematically start to wean themselves off of aid? The good news is that there is. Countries like Rwanda. Has anybody been to Rwanda? Quite a number of people here. I don't know when you went. Has anybody been there recently? Yeah? <laughs> what was that? Oh, OK. That's pretty recent. <laughs> um, I want to be Rwandan. The country is un believable what they've done in 15 years. Now, President Kagame gets pilloried, gets screamed at. He's very vocal against aid for philosophical reasons, by the way. My reasons are mainly economics, but his reasons, he believes um, that, uh, in fact, his, to quote him, he said, any country in Africa that relies on the international community for aid has not had a genocide. And I thought that was pretty hard to swallow, but he said, you, you have to experience the international community leaving you to your own devices before you understand that you better find alternative ways of financing your development. It's a brutal lesson that they've learned. And you know, President Kagame, as I said, he does get criticized quite a lot. But his philosophy is very simple. If you can get a society to rally behind one thing, economic growth, a better life for their child, everyone's children, doesn't matter where you come from, then you have a better shot than spending years arguing about uh, who did what when. Um, I'm not going to make the case for him, but he's another person you should put on your list to try and get here because he's got a lot of stories to tell. In 15 years, uh, and people might know this, Rwanda this year was ranked by the World Bank's um, doing business around the world. Is that me who's making that sound? Is it? Um, the survey that I alluded to earlier, the World Bank, um, World Bank survey, Rwanda was ranked the most improved this year. It's not by accident. Um, they have worked incredibly hard to transform the story. They're very focused on bringing in investment. They've got a long way to go. But I can assure you that they're much further along than a lot of other countries uh, on the continent. OK, you've heard enough from me. I'm just going to end, up on, end off with uh, uh, a quote from a friend of mine, Nigerian friend, who pulled me aside and said, why are you bothering writing this book? It's a complete waste of time. Everybody knows that aid doesn't work. And uh, he said to me, you have to appreciate that people don't, they continue to push this model because they have very low expectations about Africa. And I tried to argue with him. And he said, Dambisa, Africa is to development 
what Mars is to NASA. Every year, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars doing research, analyzing experiments, sending over uh, teams of people. But frankly, nobody actually believes that we're going to ever live on Mars. And the fundamental problem is that nobody ever believes that we're going to actually see Africa develop. I will leave it there, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dambisa. Uh, we have microphones, so uh, uh, just raise your hand and we'll put the mic microphone over in your aisle and have it passed down. Uh, we also have people in the remotes that will be uh, providing their questions on cards, uh, but let's get right to it. We're in the back. Did you want to? Hi, Dr. Moyo, and uh, welcome to North Carolina. Um, uh, so I'm a returned Peace Corps volunteer from Cameroon, and uh, I guess a professional development worker. Um, and uh, I agree with almost everything you say, and almost everyone I work with does as well. Um, so I uh, just take an example from your book, and let's assume a, uh, a theoretical s a scenario in which all the bilateral and multilateral donors pulled their funding from the countries that don't, well, may not really need it, but need it less than others. Um, even in that unlikely scenario, I don't really see those governments changing at all. Um, you know, even the ones like uh, in Zambia or Nigeria or Senegal or anywhere else, they're still going to be incompetent and they're still going to be um, corrupt and, and everything else. So in, in those kind of scenarios, how do you think that um, the pullout of aid would really affect the, the operation of those governments in the short and long term? Um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I think it's interesting the countries that you picked are all mineral dependent. And I think it's important for me to just clarify, and I do make this point in the book, that I am not saying that aid is the only source of underdevelopment. I am saying that the problem with the aid system is that it's a, an active policy of us going out there to give money to try and do something. Um, the reason I point this out is because uh, you are right that there would still be a number of issues. There are a number of countries that um, continue to underperform un and uh, remain underdeveloped, um, even though they don't have much aid. Nigeria is an example of that. They do have high corruption, and a lot of that is associated with what's called the oil curse. So you're right, um, just to make that delineation, that you, you are right that there, there could still be corruption um, and underperformance uh, in countries that are very heavily uh, uh, heavily oil dependent or, or mineral dependent. Um, the point, however, though, is that we have to understand that with a um, cutting of the umbilical cord between the <coughs> aid donor and the aid recipient in the form of African state, you actually are forcing them, if they wish to stay in, in power, which most politicians do, you're forcing them to find alternative ways of financing. And by and large, those other ways of financing tend to be um, much more transparent, um, much better in terms of um, broad-based opportunities for economic growth and, and development. Um, what I'm talking about is something similar to what's happened in Zimbabwe quite recently. Uh, the economy has been dollarized, and that just basically means that they've cut off the financing. I mean, before, Mugabe could just turn on the printing machine and print as many Zimb Zimbabwean dollars as he wanted. Um, that has now been taken away from him, and so his power in terms of being able to keep the uh, army on side has diminished considerably. And that's essentially the same framework that I would argue would prevail in an African context if you were to get the government off of aid. Um, right now, the governments, uh, even when, without getting the, the money itself, they don't do their job. They are in office to provide public goods, and they're not doing that. Uh, but we can't get them out as Africans. How are we supposed to get them out when actually they are coming to, the New, York, uh, to New York to do um, uh, presentations and meets the administrations in Europe. I mean, it's, it's virtually impossible. And so I'm actually just saying that I do think it would be a, a remarkable turnaround and a substantial um, impact to the political framework um, and infrastructure if you could get rid of the governments through um, cutting off of aid. Good evening, Ms. Moyo, um, Dr. Moyo. My name is Natalie Gill. I lived uh, for three and a half years in Zambia. Uh, first as a Peace Corps volunteer and then a third year working with an NGO. So I kind of saw 
the issues on both sides. I know you focus on government to government aid a lot in your book and you touch a little bit on humanitarian aid. And uh, one of the things I found was the level of um, hopelessness and um, that was raised in the rural areas that I lived in. And I wanted to know if you can think of some ways that we can be more sustainable about humanitarian aid as well because um, one of the things that villagers used to always say to me was, you know, why haven't you brought us anything? Which is meaning they kind of expected aid because they were used to being, I was in Choma district which had seen drought, which had seen rain downpours, so they had a lot of emergency aid coming in and they were really dependent on that. So I just wanted to get your views on that. Sure. I mean, I think w something else that really bothers me is um, my parents grew up in the colonial era um, and saw independence um, come to not just to Zambia, which was northern Rhodesia, but also um, across the continent. And I would say as they're sort of um, Obama, President Obama's father's generation. So they went abroad and immediately raced back home because so many positive things were happening. But it was also a time of dignity. Um, the way they describe the leaders of that time, like Kenneth Kaunda and uh, Nkrumah of Ghana or Nyerere, I'm not saying that they, all their policies were great, but there was a sense of dignity associated with being African at that time. Uh, my parents are now older, and that's one of the things that they think has been eroded quite considerably. Um, and so your point about begging, which is basically what you're talking about, is something that um, unfortunately, uh, I would argue, is not just at the village level, it's at our leadership level. Um, there is no shame in going to skulking around at the G20 meetings, because they're not, they're not invited, they're not G20 countries. So they skulk around the corridors, <laughs> corridors asking for money. Um, in the middle of a financial crisis as if they somehow weren't around for the past 18 months. And it's that type of uh, lack of dignity, a lack of confidence, a lack of belief in the continent, which President Kagame talks a lot about, um, the philosophical arguments about why you actually have a cultural erosion um, under an aid system. Um, and he talks extensively, and others have talked about this as well, um, of giving examples uh, from, from uh, here in the United States with the, uh, uh, I have to say, I'm so not PC, I don't know what the term is now, but uh, you know, the, the First Nation, what they call First Nation in Canada, but the original Indian settlers, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know what the term is, but um, those societies and how they've dealt with largesse and, and that type of thing is something that I think, uh, it's, 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 cra it's quite tragic actually that we're not dealing with that. Now, coming back to your fundamental point, what can we be doing? Um, in the second part of the book, I do talk about the need for innovation. And um, nobody's saying, turn off the taps tomorrow and let these Africans uh, you know, fend for themselves. And one of the things that I find very interesting that people rarely talk about in the context of Africa are conditional aid transfers. So this is where instead of giving money to the governments, you actually support monies directly to families. Now, it's not the same as what um, has been done uh, in the First Nation uh, Indian uh, populations in, in uh, North America. The difference being, and by the way, a lot of these conditional transfers have done very well in places like Mexico and Brazil, and uh, Mayor Bloomberg in New York has got a, a pilot program to try, and, to, uh, try it out in, in the United States. And it's very simple. What you do is you reward people for doing the right thing. So your child goes to school 85% of the time, you get $10. Uh, your daughter gets immunized for polio, you get $20. Now, there are lots of philosophical issues here because we would hope that we live in a society where people want to do the right thing for their children, but the reality is um, sometimes it's not the case. And so that's the kind of innovation I think we should be thinking about. Um, work by Mohammed Yunus, microfinance. Um, why should that come from a guy who happens to be in Bangladesh? Why shouldn't the World Bank that has got thousands of employees working day and night on development issues, why shouldn't they be the ones who've come up with this idea? They haven't. Um, the Peruvian economist I was talking about earlier is Hernando de Soto. He came up with the idea of property rights. You know, people might scoff and giggle in the background, but you know what, he's come up with something interesting and new. And we should ask our quest, you know, questions about whether that might be the way forward. Why should it be somebody in Peru who's coming up with that idea? Why, what's happening with people at the World Bank and the IMF and these development in institutions? So it's a long-winded way of saying, I think what we need is innovation. People are clearly suffering. Um, something is clearly not working. And it's important for us to question it with the best intentions. I mean, for me, I want to, want to ensure that uh, my children and my children's children um, 
have a better life. I mean, that's, isn't that what the essence of, of life is, that we want to have better lives than our parents, and we want our kids to have better lives than ourselves. But there's a problem if that's not what's happening in Africa. I mean, my life is actually better than my parents' life. Um, but I can't be sure that the next generation of Africans is going to be better than mine. There are a number of ways. Oh, hi, my name is Matt, and I really enjoyed your book. And I'm a high school teacher, and there are 10 of our kids who are here to see you tonight. Oh, that's great. Um, <coughs> I enjoyed your book. One of the things that I didn't see you touch upon in the book is an idea that um, Paul Collier talked about a bit in The Bottom Billion, where he said, I know this isn't so popular post-Iraq, but just in purely unsentimental terms, sometimes military interventions on behalf of Western nations can save a lot of money from being spent, not only on wars between states, but more importantly, within a state. I'm wondering what your take is on that, and then if you were in favor of Western intervention to prevent or to stop wars, how many situations like that would, would you see in today's world in Africa? Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> how many countries are there in Africa again? Um, Okay, so my disclaimer is I'm not a political scientist, um, and I don't write on uh, political issues. I think Paul Collier does make a compelling argument uh, for the need uh, to intervene, particularly after uh, a civil war. Um, it's kind of a, uh, it's sort of like a recidivism, the risk that countries slip back into war uh, after, um, after a civil war is over uh, is quite high because the society hasn't actually spent time to kind of bed down um, new economic policies and so on. Um, I'm sympathetic to it, but I think that we have a better way of avoiding the wars in the first place, which is give people vested interests in their societies. Um, I would argue, and I actually wrote an article um, about um, uh, the fact that I think the reason why we saw less, uh, we didn't see a, an outbreak of full-scale uh, war in Kenya in 2007, December, was because many Kenyans are now have some foot on, have a foot on the economic ladder there. They have a vested interest in their society. They don't want it to go to pot. They want their children to live there. They want to have clean water and infrastructure and everything, all the good stuff that we all want. Um, and so I think rather than trying to wait until these nation states start to collapse and we need to step in like a Somalia case, I think we should start to do preventative medicine, which is to create the opportunities so that people have jobs, have opportunities, and um, therefore we can avoid the political interventions that, uh, that Paul Collier is talking about. Now, that might be a pipe dream because people don't really care until things have really gone awry. Um, but I just don't think it's possible. I mean, again, who would we turn to? If we turn to the United States, I mean, look what's happened in Somalia. Look what's happened in Zimbabwe. How long was the war in Liberia and Sierra Leone? There, as I said, there have been four coups. What has the United States done? So we, we certainly as Africans, and I think around the world, there are lots of places where people cannot sit back and, and hope that there will be this military force that kind of goes around. That's what the UN is supposed to do, but we know their record. Um, you know, so the fact of the matter is I think that uh, we need to focus on prevention rather than cure. And I, but I, I am sympathetic to Paul's view um, that we need to, to step in. I have a question from the overflow room. Someone asked, uh, many current and former US officials continue to criticize China's role in aid to Africa, and what is your opinion on that, and where do you see the future of that? So it was once my opinion versus? Um, versus the U.S. criticism of China's role. Versus the U.S. president? Criticism. Oh, U.S. criticism. Oh, right. Well, I love the Chinese. Um, I have a, chi a chapter in my book called The Chinese Are, my, are Our Friends. Um, I think they have a lot of issues. They're not, they should not be coming into Africa carte blanche, of course. I, mean, I think that uh, there are labor laws that are of concern. I think there are uh, great concerns around environmental issues. But whose job is it? Why is it possible for America to borrow money from China and nobody to be worried about human rights? Because your policymakers are working, right? The problem in Africa is that our policymakers are not working on behalf of the African people. So until we need to, again, motivate African governments. As I said, if African governments were working on behalf of Africans, we wouldn't need the international media to start to take care of us and say, oh, no, but it's neocolonialism. Why should it be neocolonialism in Africa and not neocolonialism in the United States? Again, we're trying to develop our societies over the long term to make sure that we've got the right political infrastructure to make sure that we're not taking advantage of. Now, I also fundamentally believe that the Chinese approach to Africa is much better because they don't, they don't come to Africa with sympathy, nor is it religion or democracy. I mean, they're there for one thing and one thing only, and it's business. And um, it might be, some people might find that quite repulsive, but we need jobs. 
We need jobs, and again, this is where African policy should make us step in and ensure that Africans are getting jobs from the uh, presence of the Chinese. So I, I think the Chinese, I would say, should be welcome, but again, um, tempered with um, well-functioning African governments. We're going to have a uh, question here, but let me ask one more from the remote area, <clears throat> and it is, if aid was to be stopped, what do you see as the possible consequences? Wouldn't it put the countries into disarray? Stop aid, what would happen? As opposed to now, when they're not in disarray. <laughs> um, no, I don't mean to be, to be flippant, um, but the fact of the matter is um, most of the money that gets to Africa does not go to the Africans on the ground. In fact, somebody was just telling me yesterday that um, President Rawlings, who, was, uh, who threw, a, threw another coup, uh, took office in Ghana, has been going around now saying, why are you bothering giving aid to these leaders? The fact of the matter is you should just transfer it directly to the Swiss bank accounts because you know it doesn't go to the average person. <laughs> and um, it's kind of like that. It is like that. Um, you know, I think that, I, I personally do not think that most Africans would suffer um, because uh, aid has been turned off. I think the vast majority of Africans don't see a dime of aid, which is why most of us are still living on uh, less than a dollar a day. Um, now, there are obviously, there would be an impact, and, and uh, that's why my, my policy recommendation, again, is not to turn aid off immediately. We're trying to wean them off so that they can start to think about other ways of financing development. In fact, uh, tomorrow, I have, uh, I wrote an article for The Economist, if you're interested in this topic. Um, it comes out tomorrow, and basically the article is talking about one other way of financing development, which is through the capital markets, which I've been slagged off about um, quite a bit. Um, People say, oh, you know, but African countries can't come to the capital markets. Why not? It's a transparent way. It's not perfect, but it's a transparent way of knowing who's doing their job and who's not. There are 15 countries in Africa today that have credit ratings, but the international community is telling them not to go and do bonds. Why not? What's the problem? It's, again, low expectations. They should force these governments to go into the public market so that when we see them fail, we can point fingers at them and they can be held, held to account. Why should it be all sort of cloak and dagger? I, I, it's, to me, I just don't understand that. And uh, that is, to me, I think a, an, a, is an outrageous thing. So the long-winded long answers, um, uh, short answers basically, I think that um, more weight is placed on what might happen um, of a scenario that I don't think would actually occur. Um, things are incredibly bad right now um, across the African continent. The, the notion that they would get worse, um, I think, is, is just not right at all. Uh, good evening, Dr. Moyo. Uh, my name is Janine Kamar, and welcome to North Carolina. Thank you. Um, as an aspiring development professional, and I'm an American, I'm of African descent. My mom here is from Liberia, but I was born here. Um, I do care about the development of Africa, and I just wanted to ask: Do you think if Westerners do Westerners have any role to play in the development of uh, in the development of Africa, and if so, what? Absolutely, you do. Absolutely, and that's again: do not misunderstand what I'm saying. I am not saying everybody pack up and go home. This is a global problem. You know, do not, the, the guy, the pirate who was shipped to America, that, is not, that does not mean that Africa is separate from the United States. It means precisely that we are linked. And whether it's environmental damage, urbanization, disease, the whole list of uh, concerns that are going around and climate and so on, um, you cannot say, oh, well, it's Africa over there. It will, all of us will be affected. Um, so it is absolutely a global concern. Um, what should we be doing? Well, first of all, write to your senators and say this is ridiculous. You know, it's been 60 years. There is not a single government or business that would survive for as long as the aid system has survived with this type of a record. But people don't ask the question. They don't ask what is going on. I am not saying don't help Africa. I'm saying do what it is that has taken, that has made America great. Do what we know has made um, the United, United Kingdom, Germany, those countries, great. Those countries were not great because somebody was handing out aid indefinitely. Those countries have focused on working hard, focused on investment, focused on innovation. Those are not things that are, those are not the buzzwords around Africa. And unfortunately, I mean, I think there are lots of things you can do, things like <coughs> microfinance. I, I always talk about Kiva. Again, I mean, I have to say, I've lived in a number of countries. I've been fortunate enough to do that. And one thing that you should not, uh, underestimate about the United States is just the degree of innovation. This country is unbelievable with in in innovation. And some of the innovations coming out with respect to development are incredible. 
Um, there are things like uh, Nick Negroponte at MIT came up with uh, one laptop per child. I don't know if people know about this. Uh, it's a laptop that was built, it was supposed to be for about $100, um, where African kids can use it using solar power. Innovation. So what? He doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't sell off like hotcakes. Somebody's thinking. Somebody's trying something different. Kiva, a married couple out in California. Um, they're using the internet as an interface. You can lend as little as $25. Lend, by the way, is the operative word, to anybody anywhere on earth. You go on there. People are giving it to their kids now for Christmas presents. So you give them $25. Um, you might have a woman from Kenya who wants to start a hair salon and um, she needs $500. Well, you give $25, somebody in Japan gives another $25, somebody in Denmark gives $50. She borrows that money, invests in her business. These are small-scale things that we can do. But again, they're at least providing or creating longer-term solutions. Um, I say right to your senators because there is a fundamental problem here. Our governments need to change their mindset. They need to focus on investment. They need to force these governments to come out, to be more accountable. And part of that process is by being transparent by the bond markets, for example. We cannot continue to mollycoddle them. So that's what I would say. Um, oh, me, I think. Hi, um, I'm Joel Semakula. Oh. I, was <laughs> <laughs> I was born in Uganda, but I grew up in the UK. Um, I guess my question is about, what, what do you say about uh, the fact that the reason the current aid system is being maintained in the way it is is because of the power that allows um, developed nations to maintain over developing nations um, and perhaps in the way that they can, uh, uh, they can dictate how policy is shaped in those countries and, and the, power, the power imbalance that maintains. So one example being uh, George Bush uh, refusing aid to organizations or sexual health organizations that didn't uh, promote um, abstinence-only programs or something like that. Uh, what do you say uh, to that comment? Um, okay, so I think there are kind of two answers. My, my philosophy, which I think people don't necessarily always like, is, and I think I was telling somebody today, actually we were talking about this in the car, I think, um, about uh, Shakespeare's quote, actually it was much earlier today, um, that neither a lender or borrower would be. If I'm going to borrow from a bank and they harass me about how, what I'm doing with the money that they've lent me, you know what, I borrowed from them. They have every right to do that. Um, I don't like George, I didn't like George Bush's policy. Um, you know, to, and I felt that there was a cultural overlay and I thought it was quite unnecessary. But the fact of the matter is that as long as you're gonna borrow money or take money from, the do, you know, from donors, they have every right to tell you what to do with it. Um, and it's, it's an unfortunate situation, but that's the reality. Um, but the more fundamental question, I think you were, you were touching on there as well, is why, why does this system perpetuate? Why are we in a situation where, if it's so obvious, as I'm portraying it to you, why is it that we continue to give aid? Why isn't, why isn't there much more outrage? And I would say there are at least two reasons for that. Um, first of all, it is cheaper, actually, for the United States, for example, to write out a check um, to African countries. Um, it's cheaper because the alternative, if they were really going to be fair, is to open your markets and say, you want, we're going to sell goods to you, you sell goods to us, and you can make money. Um, African countries lose about 300, uh, 300 billion dollars every year. 300 billion dollars in lost monies um, from exports because we can't sell our goods internationally. Now, before we all get teary-eyed about that, uh, remember that ultimately the American president is responsible for the American people. And it makes sense for him, um, and I think for many Americans would agree, for him to put in protectionist uh, policies to protect American jobs. Um, I don't like it because I'm from Zambia, but the fact of the matter is that's a reality we have to live in. Um, so it's in a way it's easier to write a check, there you go, uh, run along, and I won't open my markets because I don't want you to flood goods and, and put Americans out of work. The other thing is, um, is an argument that tends to be pushed by the French and the Americans, which is basically the argument that something like agriculture produce and food security, in particular now, it's becoming such a big issue, uh, you do not want to rely on an outside country for your food, particularly if there were a third world war, God forbid. Um, and that just means that the um, uh, farming industries tend to be supported through subsidy programs, and that leaves African countries at a, at a disadvantage. Now, in the book, I do argue that there are other markets. I mean, China has 1.3 billion people. It's got 7% arable land. They're desperate for food. 
Um, they, they, and that's why they're buying up land in Africa. Um, but here again, African governments act like they're blinded. You know, why shouldn't they say, you know what, we're going to grow food, employ our people, and sell the food to you, China? Um, but they don't do that. They're selling off the land, which again is problematic. Um, but the point being that Af I think African countries should stop focusing and being obsessed with Europe and the United States and start focusing on markets that actually need African produce. So I'm sorry if, I'm, uh, if my answers are a bit long-winded. Let me give uh, one more quick question from the remote. You talked about jobs. Uh, where does conservation fit into your idea of development? Very good question. Um, well, I have to also give another disclaimer here. I am absolutely hopeless about this whole environmental stuff. And I'll tell you, um, I'm, I'm trying to be better. I'm you know, reading up and trying to understand everything. Um, and it's, it's, it, I have to say, uh, the whole debate about environment, and please don't throw tomatoes at me after I say this, but the whole discussion about development, um, I see a lot of similarities with the discussion about climate change. Um, and, and environment and conservation. I think that we have somehow all been convinced that, the, uh, that there's a problem in the environment to the point that there's no scope for, well, what exactly is the problem? Where is the problem? And it's kind of like development. Everybody thinks there's, the problem is that Africans are poor. Um, but the, as I said earlier, we don't stop to really think about uh, Indians being, more Indians being poor, more Chinese being poor, and so on. Um, so, with the, with the issue of conservation, it's clearly important. Um, when I was in, uh, in South Africa, um, a woman said to me, I don't care. I need to put food on my table today. I don't care if tomorrow the tree's not going to be there because I can't think past today. I have to put food on the table today. And that's a problem um, because a lot of the things, whether it's CO2 emissions or water, uh, um, issues of water tables, those are things that will affect um, Africa over the long term, will affect the world over the long term, but the poverty ratios, because we're not doing enough fundamentally, means that conservation has become a secondary issue. Um, and people do see it as delinked from their immediate concerns um, for survival and livelihood. So, I mean, I would like to see more debate about uh, how climate and environmental conservation can come in, but I think right now people are just trying to survive. Um, and it, it means that it, makes, it takes a back seat. All right, Dambisa, we can take only one more question. Time is running out. Yes, right here. Yes, uh, my name is Peter Okima. I'm from Uganda and I live here in Chapel Hill. Uh, there are lots Moore. of Ugandans here. Yes. <laughs> I thought you guys had all gone home. <laughs> um, I wanted to hear from you about two items. I just returned from Uganda over the summer, and I come from northern Uganda where the LRA rebels and the conflict has been going on. And during the conflict, uh, between a uh, uh, time of 10 years, we have had a non-government organization or charities start from about 10 to about 2,000 for a population of about 2 million people. And it turned out to be what they call disaster tourists. Um, my question to you is that what is your opinion of the role of Africans in the development process of their own country or in what they think should be done for their country? Not just African leaders, just regular Africans like me and you. And what do you think if somebody says foreign aid actually benefits the person who gives the money. In other words, bilateral aid or money from the IMF, if it's given to a country like Uganda, actually the expertise has to come from the United States or from the donor country. At the end of the day, it doesn't really create jobs to the local people. What's your opinion? Thank you. Um, let me start with your second question. Uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, throughout this uh, book tour, I, I actually had the opportunity to go and visit with some people from the IMF. And I remember kind of going in, kind of a bit sort of deer in the headlights, sort of happy-go-lucky, oh, the IMF kind of thing. And I left there almost in floods of tears because it was a closed session. It was just about eight of us. And they swore me to secrecy, but what they told me is so outrageous, I have to share it with you. <laughs> um, and what they told me 
was that they, in the IMF, which I have to say, I do think of some of the development organizations, I do think that they have at least a clear mandate, um, which is not, can't be said for many other places. But they um, believe that across the African continent, where there are about, call it 50 countries, so excluding the North African countries, there are only two countries on the African continent that they feel comfortable leaving the government to put even a strategy plan together about, for education, for one sector. Now, I, I, I almost, literally almost felt myself, I could not believe this. This is 60 years later for many countries from independence. And they can only main, name two countries where the government can put together a strategy report. And I think this is precisely um, the problem that you have this society uh, where partly to do with what's happening on the ground, but partly to do with the fact that the donors are benefiting from the status quo. And it's a great tragedy. Um, and I do think that there's a, a lot of merit. I mean, in the book I argue that there obviously are political reasons why certain countries uh, that don't have poverty levels that Africa has are getting more aid money and so on. So there's that argument has been very well um, made by many, many people in the past. Um, and I do think there's a political argument there. But again, I think we should not let Africa and Africans and African leadership off, you know, off easy. Um, nobody's put a gun to our head to tell us to take aid. There are countries like South Africa and Botswana, unsurprisingly the best performers in Africa, that said we're not taking aid. We're going to take the hard route. Again, there's something to be said for South Africa and Botswana doing better than the other countries on the continent and not taking aid. This not, I mean, I'm, I think it's important not to miss that. The role of Africans, very difficult. Um, in my little microcosm of the world, I think we, the only thing we can do is change hearts and minds. Um, as I said to you early on, I think there's a lot of merit in the statement that there's a soft bigotry of low expectations. Um, and I think uh, the more Africans are out there who, um, you know, people start to understand that uh, we like flat screen televisions and high heels and, uh, you know, we like to go on holiday. Maybe people stop thinking of us as, oh, that's a recipient, uh, you know, a recipient who needs, uh, needs our help and more like these are our peers. What can we be doing together to try and transform the society? I'm going to very quickly tell you about this. Um, do people know it's Slumdog Millionaire, the, the film, yeah? So I went to dinner with these, uh, this Indian couple and uh, some friends of mine, and it was, I, I love Indian food, and so I was busy chowing down, and I said, well, you know, what do you think about Slumdog? Isn't that fantastic? And I almost got thrown out of their house. Um, <laughs> and they were so outraged, and they, I said, why? What's the problem? And they said, you know, um, for the past 10 years, I don't know whether this campaign is very big here, but the government has started something called Incredible India, the Incredible India campaign, so you get these big signs that say Incredible India. Uh, it's very popular, particularly in Europe. And, um, they said for the past 10, 15 years, the government had launched a very aggressive campaign to change people's views about India, um, to make people think of it as, as a great destination for investment, for tourism, um, and that people were actually doing some pretty amazing things, which they are. I mean, if you think about India now, I think of IT, I think of great food, I think of, uh, you know, the Taj Mahal. I don't think of kids in the slum. And they were arguing that the, the role of the PR machine um, of in the Indian government was to basically change not only people outside view, their view of, uh, of India, but also within India, people to have more confidence about being Indian and therefore um, to change the, the mindset of the country. I raise this point because um, your question about the role of Africans, um, I think it's not an accident that we rarely see with these campaigns to raise money, you rarely see Chinese children, you rarely see Indian children, it's almost exclusively African children. Um, and an, a woman in Kenya said to me, it's hard enough raising a teenager. Try raising a young person when they're constantly being told that they can't do it, they're poor, they're a dragon society, all that negative PR associated with being an African. And my point simply is that I think in our little worlds as Africans, uh, what we can do is to try and change the hearts and minds of individuals so that they know that we're very much like everybody else in the world, and as I said, Seeing so many young people, I was in Rwanda doing a presentation to about 624-year-olds, and they're dying for Twitter and Facebook, and 
that's part of the that's part of the story. Yes, there is tragedy and difficulty, but they are also very keen to be part of, of a global story. And I think our responsibility is to start to change the PR of our continent. And I'm, the last thing I'm going to say is that there's a fantastic film that's being made right now. Two African teenagers. Oh, there are two films being made. One of them is completely negative, horrible, poverty, blah blah blah. Ignore that one. <laughs> the better one is two African uh, teenagers who, uh, it's about, they're starting off in Rwanda, and uh, they are going to, it's basically about their lives. They run away from home, and uh, like some teen teenagers do, and uh, they're going to end up in South Africa. They run away to go to the World Cup, um, and the film is going to be launched the day of the World Cup 2010 in South Africa. So look out for it. It's going to be positive, it's going to, and it's not just going to be about the beautiful skyline in Africa and the landscape, it's going to be about the people as well. So I hope you look out for it, and I hope you change your hearts and minds about the continent and do something positive for us. Well. <laughs> I think that applause says, it's all, says, it, says it all. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this uh, thought-provoking lecture and discussion afterwards. Uh, let me uh, tell you that there will be shuttle buses uh, returning to campus beginning in about uh, five minutes. Uh, some of them might be there right now for those who've got to get back quickly. But in the meantime, uh, everyone is invited to join us for light refreshments in the lobby of the Friday Center. Thanks again for coming. Remember, they should not pretend to themselves that they care about our continent more than we do. And I think that was a very, very powerful statement. Um, certainly as an African, it was really quite moving. And I have noticed, having spent a lot of time on the road this year, that people do have that sense that somehow they care more about Africa than we as Africans do. Um, and yet our families live there, we are from there, and hopefully um, generations to come of Africans will be able to live there. In, uh, in, in decent living conditions. So we need African governments involved. The third point I have to say I've completely stolen. It's an, a point that was made by um, the, the um, Minister of Development in Norway. Some people in here might be aware that Norway gives 1% of its income, the country's income, to aid. So um, when my book first came out, I got an invitation to go to Norway. I was pretty surprised. I was like, this is weird. Um, a country that gives them um, so much aid um, has asked me to go and visit with them. Um, I don't know if there are any people from Scandinavia, Norway in here, anyone? No, nobody? Oh, oh somebody there in the back. Anyway, they're very open people, um, and you know, they love a debate, they love a good, a good, uh, a good argument, and so um, I had never been to Oslo, and so I immediately said yes, and I, I went on my way. And um, I was in a debate, public forum, with the minister, and um, surprisingly, Minister Sondheim, uh, Minister of, of Development, said, we all have to accept that aid has contributed to the dysfunctionality of African governments. And I looked at him stunned, because I was like, hang on, he's making my points for me. Um, but I was very ha happy to hear that. Um, and I think that is really, really important. I'm mean, here is a government minister who supports the aid regime, but he at the same time is critical enough to say, let's accept where it is lacking. Um, I will come back to this point a little bit later, but suffice it to say, the manner in which aid is causing a dysfunctionality of African governments does vary. On the one hand, we know, you know if, you, if you went outside now and polled 100 people um, and asked them what they think the problem with aid is to Africa, most people would say corruption. So that's a big story, it's always in the news. Um, but even in the best case scenarios, one of the problems with the aid system is that it allows African governments to abdicate their responsibilities of providing public goods to people like me. So I will come back to this point because I, it's very, very important. It's actually at the crux of the problem um, that we're facing in Africa today.
So those are the three points, and I, I hope that uh, you bear them in mind. As I said, uh, number one, we, do, we want to see Africa develop. Number two, we want to get African governments uh, engaged. And number three, we have to accept that aid has certainly contributed um, to the uh, dysfunctionality of African governments. Um, I did jump ahead a little bit because I haven't really explained what I mean by aid. Um, on page seven of my book, I believe, I do explain that there are different types of aid, and very quickly, uh, I delineate them into three categories. The first type of aid is what we would call humanitarian or emergency aid. So think about Katrina or an earthquake in Iran or the tsunami um, or floods in Mozambique, and I think we as a global society have a moral imperative to act when that kind of thing happens. Um, and so I am not criticizing emergency aid. The second type of aid is what I call NGO and charitable aid. Um, so this is sort of send $3 a month to build a well in Zambia, which is where I'm from, or um, send $10 a month to help a girl go to school. Um, I myself am involved in charities. Um, quite a number of, of fantastic charities. One of them uh, had a gala, that, which is why I was a bit late coming. I lived in the United States for many years, and I was shocked at how much green there is here. And so I must say, you live in an amazing place. Um, do not take it for granted. Um, it is an absolute delight and pleasure for me to be here this evening. Um, I have to tell you, I'm not sure I would have shown up with the amount of rain that's outside. Um, so I'm really grateful that you've made it. And to me, it really is a, uh, a signal that uh, you, like me, are incredibly concerned about um, the state of affairs, not just in Africa, but across the developing world, um, in places where countries continue to rely very heavily on the largesse from outside. Um, what I thought I'd do this evening is really spend some time um, talking a little bit about some of the arguments that I make in the book. I don't want to give you everything so that you can go out and buy it. Um, <laughs> but also talk a little bit about solutions. And my, my intention in this book was not to be um, a naysayer. Um, a friend of mine once said there are two types of people. There are yes people and there are no people. And uh, I happen to come from a home of um, yes people because my parents um, somehow were so deluded that they didn't tell me that uh, actually there were certain things I was not supposed to be able to do. So um, being raised in the Moyo household basically meant that when I said I want to go and study in the United States, I said, absolutely, go ahead, you can do it. And I only found out later that uh, people would say, well, actually, you know, you're an African woman from Zambia, so maybe you won't be able to make it there. Um, so I, I'm a yes person. My book is about um, things that we as a global society can and should be doing to actually transform um, the African uh, uh, condition. Um, my main thesis is very simple. The current aid system um, that pervades the African continent is, I believe, couched in what um, George Bush, and I have to say, I'm very surprised I'm quoting him, um, <laughs> but what I believe George Bush uh, said was um, this, the soft bigotry of low expectations. Um, I strongly believe that there is one method and uh, policy of economic development when it comes to countries like China, Russia, India, Brazil, and a completely different approach to economic development when it comes to countries across the African continent. I'm here to tell you today that for the past 60 years, over $1 trillion of aid has gone to Africa. That's about $100 for every man, woman, and child on Earth today. And yet, growth is less today than it was um, in, in the 1970s. And in the 1970s, 10% um, of the African population lived on less than a dollar a day. Um, today, over 70% of Africans live on less than a dollar a day. Clearly, something is wrong. And uh, I'm here to explain to you what I think is going on. Uh, in fact, what I know is going on. I was raised in Zambia, Southern Africa. I went to primary school, secondary school, and university until we had a uh, coup, coup d'etat in 1991. Um, any good African country has to have an attempt to overthrow of government. So we had ours in 1991. Um, and so anyone who says that I am not African or somehow, um, as uh, Jeffrey Sachs has said, uh, I don't have a child in rural Africa, therefore I have no right to say anything about what's going on in the continent is completely absurd. Uh, my family lives in Africa. I'm in Africa about once every five weeks, somewhere, somewhere across the continent. Um, and I think it's uh, really important for us as a global society to take a good hard look at what's going on across this continent.
I want to start off by saying that there are at least three things that I believe we agree on. And by we, I mean the world in general. I think um, it's very easy for people to say, well, she's against aid and he's pro-aid and they're fighting against each other. And um, having spent uh, many years living in the United States and also in Europe, I know there's a, a lovely tendency um, for people to want to pigeonhole people. She's Republican, he's Democrat, she's black, he's white, uh, she's uh, 40, between 40 and 45 and so on. So we're always categorizing. And so immediately my book came out, they, they, I got labeled as a, a right-wing, um, anti-aid uh, um, person. And I'm here to say, that we should not, as a society, get caught up in these titles. Um, I think it's critically important that we look at the issues based on logic and evidence, which is why I love coming to academic institutions, and not on emotion, because the emotion has not helped. There are specifically three things that I believe we all agree on. The first thing I believe we all agree on is that nobody wants Africa to be dependent on aid forever. And by the way, I, I always offer the opportunity to the audience, if anybody thinks that we do want to see Africa on aid forever, you're welcome to put your hand up and we can have that debate. But I think the goal, which tends to be lost, is we would love to see Africa and African countries and Africans as equal partners on the global stage. We don't want to live in a society where it's us and them, donor and recipient, and uh, Africa continues to be viewed very much as a drag on the global economy. The second thing I think is critically important that we need to understand is that we need African governments to be involved front and center at the de development agenda. It is not good enough for Westerners as individuals to care about Africa. And it's not good enough for African individuals like myself to care about Africa. And nor does it matter if America or Western governments care about Africa if the African governments themselves are not leading the charge of economic development. This is really, really important. And uh, there was a wonderful article that was written by um, President Kagame of Rwanda back in February um, this year uh, in the Financial Times, where he said people need 